everyone. Welcome to the Light Gang. Uh, we have a really cool show tonight, and I can't wait for this one to get going. Uh, we are coming to you from the beautiful city of New Orleans in Louisiana at the United Public Radio Network at 107.7 FM and the, Un the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. I want to tell you all, I hope you all had a great weekend. We had a nominal weekend, but it got better all day today, so we're good. Go Preston. Um, Dolly, do you have the YouTube up? We're getting a, a double feedback. Um, I think our guest may have his phone on and we can hear him. Dolly, do you have the YouTube up? We're getting a, a double Or is your phone on? Yes. Turn down your sound, Jake. There we go. Um, something's going on. I don't know. Where's your phone? It's definitely your telephone. Yeah, if you keep looking at the computer, you're not looking for your phone. Just saying. No, we're, we're still getting a double feedback. Then it's Jake. Just saying. Hold on a second. Let me try this. We're still getting a double feedback. Okay, no. Then it's Jake. Wait, let's see here. Hold on a second. No. I think we're still getting a double feedback. So okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> let me mute Welcome you. to Monday, everybody. I'm gonna drop you out and bring you back in, okay? Bye. Again, it's not me. Here we go. I'm gonna drop you out and bring you back in, okay? It's definitely something on your end. Where is your telephone? Here we go. Um I don't my phone's off. Something on your end. Where is your telephone? Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna drop you out and bring you back in, okay? Okay, hold on a second. Drop all the windows on your computer but the show. Um. Testing one, two, three. That was it. You had an open window to YouTube. Oh, no, I can't see you or hear you. Do you have two windows open on your computer? No. Are you sure? Positive. Because we're getting... Do you have two windows open on your computer? No. Are you sure? <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're we're trying. We're working on some technical details here. Let's um, ask. Tell. Okay, I'm going to bring Jake in. Everybody, Sorry. this is Jake Robbins. We're going to ask Jake if he's got a, an open phone line. Hold on. Ask Hi, Jake. Okay, I'm gonna bring Jake. Do you have an open phone line? Your phone's not on YouTube right now with the sound up. <laughs> okay you know what um jake can you log out and log back in okay you know what um jake can you log out and log back in that's what i'm gonna do All right. Are we repeating? Okay, Dolly, you're muted now. No, I'm not. There, I unmuted you. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we're good now. Yep. Oh. No, I'm not. We're not good. Okay, I tell you what, I'll drop out now, okay? How's that? 
All right. All right. Be right back. Thank you all. Hold on. Okay, I tell you what, I'll drop that one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm not sure what's going on here. <sighs> okay. Sorry, guys. I'm not sure what's going on here. Here. Okay, if I drop out, it cancels the show. I have to stay in the room. I'm in control of the board. All How's right. that? Okay, if I drop out, it cancels the show. Well, I'm going to try muting you to see if that's the problem. All right. Okay. Now I've muted you, so I should be the only one talking. Well, I'm going to try muting you to see if that's the problem. All right. Now I've muted you, so I should be the only one talking. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Preston, I heard you talking on the extra sound after you muted me. What? What? I, I, what I only have one window you? open. Go to one microphone. I'm going to drop out again. Hold on a second. This is getting weird. Hi, Jake. Say something. Jake, can you hear me? Oh. Hi, Jake. Say something. This is getting weirder and weirder. Jake, Jake, can you hear me? Oh my God. How about Jake, now? You, okay, say something. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. We're waiting for a president to come back now. Hmm. How strange. <laughs> no, no, not for us, it's not. Yeah. We've had Mondays that are so weird, weird got weirder. I'm not kidding you. A lot, of, a lot of working parts. Yeah, it goes beyond that sometimes. I, I'm not kidding. It's really yeah, I remember uh, Raphael, my friend, when he came on, you guys were having. Maybe it's the two That's of us. He's, he's like he's like a big brother to me. Here we go. Okay, let's try this again. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what happened. Device not connected. Okay, so. Okay, let's try this again. Still getting a feedback. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what happened. Device Will you take off your big, um, okay, your big, go on your computer. Feedback. Turn the sound off, off on your, one of your mics have got to go.
new timeout links. You can now put people in timeout for different things. Got it. Thank you. No echo now. Are you there? I'm perfectly fine. It's you. No, it's not me. I only have one window. We've never had any problem. Turn off your big mic. It's doubling. Um, Go on your computer mic. It's not that. It's, it's not that. Right now. All right. Well, it's not me. <laughs> Crazy cheese balls. Are you sure you don't have YouTube open on your Windows? I'm sure. Are you sure you don't have YouTube open on your Windows? Um, testing, testing. Much better. Hey. Okay, let Jake know he can come back in. Come, come back on. I kicked him uh, his thing out because it was weird, and you tell him just email him and tell him he can come back in. You want to know what's funny, everybody? We bring Jake in before we start the show. And we test everything out. Hi, Jake. Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Are we good? We're very good. This is it. Are we, are we live? Yes, we are live. We've been live through all of this. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Honestly, guys, there was just some weird feedback loop. God knows what's going on, but it looks like we got it solved. <laughs> they hung up. That's what happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I have no idea what that was, but we are not getting an echo, so we're good. <laughs> so sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. All right, Dolly, you want to start again? Sure. Well, we already did it. It's all going to be on here, but okay. Welcome to the Light Gate, everybody. We're coming to you from the beautiful city of New Orleans in Louisiana at the United Public Radio Network at 107.7 FM. And we're also coming to you with you, uh, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. We are on uh, Roku and uh, many other uh, things like Facebook and um, YouTube. YouTube and other other platforms. It's really kind of cool. Go Preston. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dolly. I'm Preston Dennett, your host, and my lovely co-host is Dolly Safran. One of these days, I'll point in the right direction. And our guest is already in chat, or I mean, in, on the screen. We'll be introducing him shortly. But first, I do want to apologize for to everyone for the mix-up, technical issues. You know how it is. Computers, you got to love them. What would we do without them? sometimes they do cause difficulties so thanks for hanging in there and i want to say hello to all you wonderful people in chat because we really appreciate you showing up so hi renee hello brian morgan the synthetic nature hi schizo music tv rafael lugo he was a prior guest very popular guest by the way uh jake's friend <laughs> our guest tonight um so hi lynn smith Hello, Janice, Johnny, Yuma, Bim Jim, Christopher Harmon. Oh, a wonderful donation from Mandy Lockhead. Thank you so much. All super chats are super appreciated. They do help 
support the show and try to make it a more professional <laughs> podcast, which we're really trying. Honestly, we are. Becky Duncan, hello. Allison Carr, look, Rad Peanut. Looks like we're on our way. Susan Alloway, a former guest just a week or two ago. And yeah, I see lots of wonderful familiar names, tools. Hi, Jim Kelly. Let's see, who else do we got here? John P. Adventures, Zach Diecast, Ruth Kleiber. Ah, Gray Troll. I hope you're doing well, Gray Troll. And yeah, all, lots of wonderful people here. Scarlet Fire. So let's just get started because we did have a little bit of a late start. But Terry D., thank you all for yeah. showing up. Central Wisconsin. Yay. Okay. We're moving along. And our guest tonight is a really interesting and wonderful guy, super kind. He is a podcaster and lifelong experiencer, and his name is Jake Robbins. And I'll just read a short quote from Jake. He says, I'm just a normal person. I do not feel special in any way. I own two businesses. I work six days a week, and I host three podcasts. He's currently hosting the Aliens, UFOs, and Ghost Stories podcast. I was honored to be a guest on that. We had all kinds of fun. But as Jake says, I'm a lifetime experiencer, and so are two people very close to me. I'm 116th Cherokee Indian. There might be a connection there. It's interesting. A lot of people with Native American heritage do seem to have experiences. And I have an incredibly intense connection to owls. I can't wait to hear about that. So yeah, Jake, thanks so much for coming on to the show. I apologize for all the weirdness. <laughs> oh, no worries. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, well, it's an honor to have you. Absolutely. Oh, uh, I'm super excited. We're going to have a fun time just talking about UFOs and paranormal. And how I always like to start is sort of dig into a person's childhood because it's fascinating to me that contact often starts at a very early age. Some people wake up to it early. Some don't wake up to it for a long time. People often go through this interesting process of integrating it into their lives. Uh, some start with denial and fear. Others just jump right into the deep end and have a good time with it from day one. So I'm interested how it kind of all rolled out for you. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> nothing really. I mean, the big one that really got my attention was um, right before I turned 21. But if there was like the youngest memory that I have, and I always just thought it was a dream. And um, that's something that as I got older, I would call a dream, not dream. And um, uh, my sister and I, I, if I had a guess, I'd probably say I was five or six. She must have been six or seven, somewhere in there. And we shared a room and I remember waking up uh, to a dream if, you know, that's at least how I perceived it. And I remember that there were three small beings that, you know, in my child brain, I said, I thought they were goblins. I used to, you know, as a kid, I liked goblins and stuff like that. So uh, I remember very clearly I was, there was a door and then to the left, there was my little twin mattress. And then to the right of the door, uh, there was hers. And then there was a window straight across from the two of us. And when I woke up, um, they were nowhere. They wanted nothing to do with me. There, there was actually two at the foot of her bed and one to, I guess that would be the left of her. And the one that was left of her almost seemed to be kind of staring at her. And the moment I saw it, I mean, I, I saw it for moments and then that's the last memory I had. And that's why I thought it was a dream for all those years. Um, mm -hmm. And then really, to be perfectly honest, nothing really out of the normal until, I mean, less than a week before I turned 21. Well, uh, let's, let's back up just a second. So you saw these three figures. What did they look like? I mean, to me, I only saw them for moments. I, I, it just felt like I fell right back asleep after after seeing them. Like I said, they didn't seem to be interested in me. They were only interested in my sister, my, my older sister. But um, I mean, I perceived them as goblins. I mean, I didn't even know what an alien was at that age. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So and then I never really thought much else about it. Um, and then from that age to, I mean, nothing really happened in my, you know, early to mid teens. The next memory I had that, I mean, I rate percentages down to all of the paranormal things that seem to happen in my life. And that's one of a handful that I, I've only written 100% uh, 
about. And it was, uh, if I had to guess, five or six days before my 21st birthday, um, my bedroom door was locked. There was no, it was an impossibility for people or pets to get into it. And if I had to guess, it was three, maybe four in the morning. And I was sleeping on my stomach facing the wall. And it was kind of a flimsy, um, like, I don't even know what it was, uh, like a metal aluminum type bed. And um, it had a top bunk and then the bottom could fold into like a couch. So it was very, very flimsy. And I woke up plain as day to something pretty heavy sitting at the edge of my bed. And as soon as it, yeah, as soon as it did, I, I jumped up in like a fighting position and turned the lights on. There was nothing there, but I mean, instantaneously jumped out of bed and oh, wow. yeah. And this is now two, two days, two days before my 21st birthday, I'm laying in bed. It's the exact same t- scenario. My door is locked. I wasn't on drugs. I wasn't drinking. And this time it's daylight in the room. I could see everything in the room. If I had a guess, I'd say it was like seven, eight in the morning. And I was sleeping on my stomach, facing the wall, and something sat on my bed again. And I opened my eyes instantly, but I was like paralyzed in fear. I'm not, I'm not somebody who's ever suffered with uh, sleep paralysis, but I just, I, feel, I felt like I could lift my head up slightly, but I couldn't turn my head. I couldn't jump out of bed like I did the first time. And then I felt a hand, I, I felt a palm in all five digits on my shoulder. And then as soon wow. as it touched my shoulder, it's, I don't know if it just scared me enough to where I could whip my head around. I never saw an apparition. I never heard a voice, but I physically saw the weight come up on the bed. And um, I didn't tell anybody about that. You know, I slept with the cross. I might, you know, I just didn't know how to perceive that. I slept with my grandpa's Bible next to my bed. <laughs> yeah. It's, Understandable. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I found out later on um, my grandma, when she was still living, she lived in Appalachia uh, way back in the mountains. And um, we were there and uh, my sister, my older sister said that she was just talking to uh, one of our cousins, one of our older cousins who had two kids at the time. And uh, she's like, you should go talk to, to uh, Justin. I was like, why is that? She's like, he said that the same thing happened to him. I thought they were messing with me. So I was really defensive. And this was, you know, a couple of years later, I might've been like 23. And uh, I was like, what happened? He said, I was sleeping, you know, at the time he was living at my grandma with, with uh, his two kids living at my grandma's house. And uh he said that he was sleeping and he figured one of the kids hopped in bed with him and he didn't think much of it. He just kind of put his hand over to see, you know, cover him up with a blanket. There's nobody there. And uh, so that, so that was the first um, inclination that obviously it wasn't um, just a one-off. And then uh, he said, go ask grandma. She says that it happens all the time. So I asked my dad's permission, you know, it's a Southern families. You know, I wanted to be polite. He's like, go ahead and ask her. And uh, she said, yeah, it's, that's your grandpa. He, you know, he sits on the bed or the edge of my bed all the time. And I always try to get him to lay down and he never will. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, wow. and then recently that was, um, there's another member of our family. Uh, one of his sons, my uncles who uh, said that it's happened to him about a dozen times, he said. So I'm almost certain that that was just the spirit of uh, my grandpa. Yeah. I was going to say it sounded more spirit than, ET. Yeah. I've heard that sort of thing from other people who've had experiences. In fact, I did interview one lady who did have this spirit coming to her bed <laughs> and, you know, being kind of intimate or mm-hmm. trying, scared the living daylights out of her. Yeah. They ended up moving. They tried moving the bed around. That didn't work. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that definitely sounds like a spiritual thing. But mm-hmm. I sure do wonder how spirits are able to, you know, press the mattress down. <laughs> that's intense yeah yeah it really was and then um after that i mean it's really like up and down i mean there could have been some stuff that i just kind of you know how it is like weird things happen and if you don't really necessarily believe in something you don't look too far into them but um i started the podcast i'm so I'm 37 now i started the podcast when i was 35 and wow. um we were chugging along and uh my older sister and i were just extremely fascinated in the subject nobody else in the family really seemed to be and um which is fine. And, um, you know, I think I was really interested in in it because I think, you know, deep down I knew something was kind of going on, but I wasn't quite sure what. So I just wanted to bring on people to kind of, because when I would tell friends and family about what I thought was might, might be happening, they would just laugh me out of the room. That really, you know, it's a bummer. So I started that and then I fell into an incredibly deep depression. Um, I stopped everything. I stopped the podcast. I think I lost like 
38 pounds in nine, nine weeks. Um, I didn't know, but I, I have, ser I had serious, uh, problems with depression, like really severe depression. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm since been medicated and, um, I just had this nagging feeling. I mean, this is like maybe nine or 10 months after stopping it completely. Um, I had this nagging feeling that I was supposed to contact one of my guests, um, who, um, she talks very open, openly about it, that she's had a baby presentation, which I have too. Um, and she sincerely believes that she's hybridized and that she has hybrid children. I don't know if that's why. I, I just had this incredible um, sense that I was supposed to call her. And telepathically, I thought I was just speaking with my spirit guides, you know? And I was saying telepathically, I was fishing. I was like, if you guys really want me to reach out to her, you're gonna have to show me a sign. And it's going to have, you know, I don't want to see an alien in my room. I don't even need to see a, a UFO. Let me just see or hear an owl because I've had this reoccurring connection. I, I kind of skipped over. I guess we can uh, go back to that. But um, and then I talked to her for about an hour and a half because that's typically how it goes with two experiencers. They talk forever. And uh, mm -hmm. the moment I get off the phone with her, uh, I'm getting out of my car. I hang up with her. I call my friend from Wyoming, who's also an experiencer. And he says, hello. And before I can say hello, an owl that had to have been 20 feet from me in a hickory tree in my backyard, obnoxiously loud. I'm going to try to do it away from the mic so it's not too loud, but it was like, woo, 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 like insanely loud. And he goes, is that an owl? And I ran, <laughs> I ran, I got my wife outside. I was like, what is that? And it did it a couple of times. And uh, she's like, that's an owl. I was like, well, where is it? It should be right there. Like I have really good, um, you know, I can see stuff. I can spot wildlife really easily. We had floodlights on in the backyard. It wasn't there at all. And um, and the really odd part was telepathically, I was still, you know, I hung up with my friend. My wife kind of had gone back inside. And uh, I said telepathically, when I look in your direction, um, I want you to hoot. If I turn my back, I want you to stop. And it did that for two minutes. Um I did skip over a few things. If you want me to circle back that this owl thing is, it makes up a lot of my experiences. Um, so during that really deep depression, this was actually before this, of course, um, it's when I started meditating, I had never really meditated before, um, seriously. And it was like, at this point I was, um, seriously considering killing myself, you know? And, um, yeah. And my, my wife was sleeping at the time and it was, who knows, two or three in the morning. And I couldn't sleep during that time at all. I mean, hardly at all. And telepathically, I said, you know, if there is something here with me, can you show me what you look like, you know? And in my mind's eye, I don't think it was physically in my room, uh, appeared an owl. And it wouldn't, it wasn't looking at me, it was facing an opposite direction. And it had like a really strange, I've never seen an owl that looked quite like it. It had like gray and white feathers. And I think once it realized that that didn't freak me out, I telepathically asked if it could turn around. And when it did, it didn't have the eyes of an owl. It had pitch black eyes, which I don't think any owls have anything but circular. And they were along like almost like almonds or, and the last memory or the last thing I saw that freaked me up, uh, freaked me out enough to where I started praying. Uh, I noticed it had like human like shoulders. I'm like, owls don't have human like shoulders. So then I started going, our father who art in heaven, probably be their name by kingdom come. It just, it scared me and uh, it just dissipated and it's never, it never showed itself to me again. And um, I'll pepper one more. I guess. Yeah. This is the last owl. And I'm leaving a bunch behind us. I've seen 17 owls in the last 14 months. And the only reason I, <laughs> the only reason I know that is because I catalog them now. Um, but so I own a tree service. Um, there's a tree that was directly over my house, but it's not on my property. It's on the HOA's property. And I offered to do it incredibly cheap, but they just, they wouldn't budge. So I essentially had to keep going to these meetings and, you know, asking them to take care of it. And uh, this was also why I was in that terrible depression. And it was a really stormy night. You know, I, I evaluate trees for a living. I understand when they're really dangerous. This thing had all sorts of rot in it. And had it came down, it would have sliced through our roof, like right over our bed. And at the very least would have severely injured us, if not killed us. And uh, this night, I mean, who knows? It could have been anywhere from one to four in the morning. And it was like raining, hailing. There were small branches falling on the roof. 
and I was like, let me just go downstairs. So I go downstairs. Um, I grab a crappy little flashlight, dollar store flashlight. Wasn't very good. And I go out my back fence. I go around and now I'm walking. And the moment I clicked it on, an owl, I don't know if it was on top of my roof or if it was flying over my roof, it flew into the tree I was concerned about. So that was the very first sighting of an owl I've ever had. It didn't make any noise. And then when I telepathically asked it to sound off, we had been here for 11 years and we'd never heard an owl. We'd, we, I saw that owl, hmm. but, but it never made a noise. So, yeah, I, I mean, weird there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's only since gotten crazier. Um, but I feel like I'm holding the, the floor too long. <laughs> Is there anything? I feel like I'm well, just no, jabbering. Yeah. No, no, it's interesting. It's, have you heard of Mike Cleland and his book, The Messengers? Yep, I've read it uh, tw twice over. I've had him on last year, and he's coming on <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> yeah. I thought you did mention that when we talked earlier. Yeah, but, yeah, we had him on, and he talked about all this kind of stuff. Hmm. Both Dolly and I shared our own owl stories. I saw a UFO, and it was just a little bit ambiguous. I'm like, come on, I need a little bit more. And that's when an owl flew right over me, and it was enormous wow so there's with mike clellan's book he really i think cemented in but when you're talking about you know seeing you know the different eyes on the owl that is to me a red flag of a screen memory yeah uh, because it's those big dark eyes that often sort of mask the the gray you know the grays have those kind of almond shaped eyes so there could be something going I'm, on there, Jake. I'm really Just interested saying. in something here because you keep, you've said it and I'm going to bring it up. Um, are you still afraid of contact? No, not at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the next time you wake up and you see something, you're going to go, oh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Absolutely. <Okay. Yeah. laughs> no, since that last conversation that you and I had, that helped me tremendously. Okay. And, um, but yeah, if we're staying chronologically, I mean, so right around the the first time I had something presented to me or pre present itself to me, I slowly became more comfortable with asking questions. And, um, you know, I was still in that depression, but, you know, I was starting to get to the point where I was kind of desperate. I was like, you know, what am I supposed to even be doing here? Like, uh, what is my purpose and who am I? And then as soon as I said, who am I? That's the only telepathic thought voice I've ever had. And it just said, Adomi, clear as day. So hmm. I wrote it down immediately. This was on a Sunday morning, ironically. My wife was still sleeping. I was wide awake, laying in bed. And I wrote it down and I wrote A-D-O-M-I. I mean, to me, it sounded Spanish. And I researched it for like two weeks with nothing. I mean, no, nothing came up at all. So I was, I convinced myself like, you're delusional. You're just making stuff up. And then once I did a lot of digging and I, I searched A-D-O-M-E and mm -hmm. it's like a domi, a singular form of the Edomites. And apparently the Edomites were... Um, these people who lived in Jerusalem before the time of the pharaohs who were yeah. kicked out for worshiping a false god. So what that means, I, I don't know. I mean, I've tried to research it the best I can. It's really hard mm -hmm. to find literature on it. Uh, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. Uh, the Greys, homeworld, where they live, where they come from, in, in the Orion belt, is uh, called en mm. It's and, pretty close. Uh, damn close, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, maybe yeah. it's a past life thing because, I mean, I'm just kind of fishing here or whatever, throwing throwing things out to see if they stick. Yeah, yeah. that's funny you say that because um, a friend of mine, Diana Kalamia, said the same thing. She said that uh, she believes one of my spirit guides is my uh, father's father, who I believe came to me in spirit um, right before I turned 21 or right before I was becoming a man. And she st felt strongly that she kept seeing like, she called it like a, blue kind of purple um uh, faint orb that mm -hmm. was near me and she she felt that it was um uh egyptian somebody that i lived with in a past life and that we were like humble people um yeah so that cool. i mean i i still don't have a solid answer on that mm -hmm. and as far as like the last memory of anything coming into my reality uh this one was pretty significant for me um this happened roughly uh two years ago maybe a year and a half ago, but I was sleeping. Um, I always sleep with my left arm over my wife's uh, waist. And I woke up in complete panic, complete fear. And I don't, I didn't know why. 
Um, but what was odd is we, we sleep with every single light off. I, I can't have any lights on or I can't fall asleep. Yes. <laughs> Pitch black I'm right with you there, yeah. I like it, pitch yeah. black. <laughs> I need pitch black, yeah. So, so I woke up in this incredible panic, and there, I'm not going to say that there was necessarily light emanating in the room, but there was light in the room, and I didn't understand how. And I'm talking, this probably was like less than three seconds. Is the moment I woke up, I was terrified, and my left arm was already around my wife's waist, and I yanked her off the bed. And I remember she she asked me because she has no memory of it. She goes, "Well, why?" And I go, "Well, I didn't want." what happened to me happened to you. And it was like a Freudian slip. I didn't even understand why I said it. So, you know what I mean? But that's yeah. interesting. You should and yes. something here. You should really consider this. Okay. When you're sleeping, you're going OBE and you don't know it. And uh, when you're OBE, your consciousness is uh, really able to see in the dark. It can see everything. It can't, it's, it's like their light is on for you everywhere you go. You see all the energy of reality. And uh, when you come out of sleep suddenly without any warning like that, you're still OBE and you may have just been looking at the room from that perspective, you know? Yeah. Cool. Oh, it's a bit, yeah. I mean, I've, I've since been trying to gather uh, more information about that, but what's really fascinating to me is um, cause that was not a dream. That was just not a dream. Um, what happened was had I done that uh, the back of my shoulders and head should have hit the wood floor. My wife's mouth or, or at least her shoulders should have hit my, my my mouth my face none of that happened hmm. at all like you know what i mean it's just almost hmm. like they turned it off before i could hurt before i could hurt me or hurt myself that's what it seemed oh. like anyway but dolly if you don't mind um because i don't want to keep going on about owls because i have one uh that happened recently that i'd really like your opinions on but uh the last conversation that we had um you had told me that you were confident that I have been on Talata uh, with you. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. that your listeners know who Talata is. Yeah. yeah. For those who don't, that's Dolly's craft. Right. So <laughs> I fly him. Yeah. <laughs> so, so do you mind um, sharing? Maybe this is maybe more or less for my listeners or, or your listeners, if they don't already know, maybe there's some new people here. Um, yeah. Kind of like the memory that you have of uh, you and I on craft together. Um, my area that I flew in was the Midwest and, uh, it was pretty frequent flyer up there and, um, all the way up until I stopped flying. And, um, we, we had regulars that we picked up. You're one of my regulars. I know who you are. And, um, I was trying very calmly to help you calm down because of your fear factor. You know, it's not that big a deal. They've been helping you out for a long time. Your family is watched over by them. Most people's are, okay? And uh, I remember you from a very small child. I'm 65 years old now, okay? And I remember you all the way up until now. So that's how I know you were on Talata. I've seen you multiple times. Uh, you're usually very stiff when you come on board. And it takes a few minutes to get you to relax and uh not be in a full panic. Um, fear, you've been taught fear for some reason. It's very strong in you. And uh, it takes a lot to calm you down and get you relaxed enough to be okay with what's going on with you. Hmm. So. Yeah, that's, that's really fast. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, um, it, it was incredibly fascinating to me and uh, my, or my sister and I. Do you have any memory of anybody else, uh, any of the other children on craft uh, with me at the same time? Pretty or much. Yeah, your sister, um, your whole family has been watched over. I mean, it's it's you're you're in that generational thing going on with the ET, especially in the Midwest. There's a lot of people up there. Y'all are interconnected to one another, and uh, so you've been watched. Uh, every time we pick somebody up, we're trying to prime you for uh, what's coming. And you get talked to, you get shown things, you know, your memories are good. With fear, it sort of blocks you off, okay? Because it's really hard to accept anything out of the normal. And you have a real religious background, okay? Very serious. And you're Southern on top of that, okay? Which makes it even harder. And uh, it takes time for you to wake up, you know, awaken. And you're working on it. You know, you're oh, doing better you. than a lot of people, so... So have you have you had uh, UFO sightings, Jake? 
not no so i'm i'm an avid uh stargazer i honest to god when i first became incredibly interested in it um sometimes it would be 20 minutes other i think my record's probably about four hours no kidding and um you know because i burn a lot of bonfires i do trees so i you know i'm burning a lot of brush and stuff like that so i've spent many of hours uh, do i believe i've seen uh an actual ufo honest to goodness uh you know i really don't um, I've seen some incredibly strange things in the sky, but I really don't believe that they were UFOs. I had one daytime sighting that f I really thought it was possible that it was, but for all it was so high, it could have been a mylar balloon because it was reflective. And um, I I haven't seen anything in the sky that I I thought could have been an orb or a UFO until uh, well, I guess I'll tell this one quickly. So after I told my family about all this owl stuff and basically what you relate to us, uh, Dolly, um, my younger sister, which ironically was the very first time I saw an owl, I was with her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she's like, she's like, and she has an owl tattoo and ironically an alien tattoo, but no memory of anything, which is, which is kind of ironic, but, um, <laughs> yeah. So she goes, uh, she called me, she lives, you know, probably about 45 minutes from me. And she's like, well, how come I, I'm not seeing anything? I was like, well, how often are you meditating and, you know, asking the universe for signs or, and she's like, well, I'm not. And I told her, I was like, well, that's not really how it works. I mean, we can try, you know, to kind of think on this for a minute and telepathically ask if we can see a sign. But I said, don't get your hopes up. I mean, it's not like a hundred out of a hundred. And we did. And uh, we did not see or hear an owl. I mean, we, we didn't have a whole lot of time to do it in, in the first place, but we were both outside and she goes, uh, whoa. I was like, what? She goes, I just saw a shooting star. It's like, okay, it's pretty cool. And then what I saw, like, again, this is moments after us both asking for something. I saw a dark, it looked like it was the size of a baseball or softball, very, very low. And it was just perfectly straight. And at the last second, it took like a quick right. And I was like, well, shooting stars don't do that. I don't know what that was. And then a UFO. <laughs> well, it I, could be. <laughs> I, I think it might have been orbs. Um, and they were very small. Oh, they were really small. Uh, they were about the size of a baseball or a softball. And the second uh -huh. one I saw was at treetop level, like oaks around us are around <laughs> 90 feet. And yeah. this one started uh straight and then like weaved in between two canopies, and they looked really low. Yeah, and I've only seen them once since then, but again, I didn't really think. I'm like, I, for all I know, my eyes are playing tricks on me. But um, so I, I want to give you a piece of advice and I want everybody who's listening to hear what I say. OK, uh, you need to start meditating before you go to sleep every night and you need a dream journal by your bed with a pencil, not a pen, because pens don't always work. And you make it your habit. You leave it open to the page you're going to write on. You put the pencil in the slot, you know, in between pages. And the second you come to. The second you come to whatever you're thinking or has been going on with you in that moment, you write it down. OK, now the meditation is for this. You go deep within, you block everything out of your mind and you set one intention. And that is that you are going to be seeing and remembering contact. OK, you're going to re revisit contact at night. OBE. OK. So that when you write it down in the morning, you can go back after a few weeks and read back what you've written and your memories are all still going to be there. And you're going to start to see a pattern forming in front of you and it will go to your actual memories to pop up. It's really hard for some people who have consciousness uh, to uh, make that connection between their consciousness and their physical mind. Fear is what blocks that signal to your physical mind. Okay. It, if you're going to, meditate and go into OBE as you go to sleep to remember your consciousness will tell your mind exactly what happened because it still knows even though your physical mind doesn't remember it it'll reinitialize that memory for you and that's one way it's almost like hypnotizing yourself okay but you're writing it down and you keep a journal and just follow it watch it and remember two things when you OBE no fear okay when you have memories it's just a memory no fear OK, and write down anything you remember, anything and just keep going. And then after a few months, you're going to look back at that and you're going to go, oh, my gosh, <laughs> look what I've re recovered from myself. This is magic. You know, I mean, you just your memory will open up for you and you'll get it. It takes time, though, and you have to be persistent. 
perspicacity, be persistent, and you'll come up with it. You know? yeah, I think there's absolutely a direct connection between how well you can remember your dreams, how well you can remember your contact experiences. Because as you know, when you wake up suddenly, and just roll out of bed, your dream, you, you leave your dream in bed, and it's gone. <laughs> I, I have that experience all the time. Whereas if I lay there and I just meditate and I can bring it back, but I had a missing time experience. I still don't remember what happened. And I'm pretty darn good at remembering my dreams and OBEs. So <laughs> I'm still working on that myself. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so for any of, any of our listeners who might be, you know, somewhat new to the subject, OBE is just an out of body experience. And I'm not sure that we said NDE yet, but I'm sure it's going to be brought up soon. That's just a near death experience. Um, and I'm curious to see what you think. I'm almost certain that you guys are going to um, uh, kind of feel the same way. Do you believe that NDEs, near-death experiences, seem to almost, in a sense, kind of uh, thin the veil, uh, so to speak, for, for people to where they can be more open up to things that might maybe happening to where other people can't? The process pretty much is, is when you leave your body in an NDE. Uh, you're still corded to yourself, but you're a little bit freer and you're more awake at that point. In other words, you're very, very, very conscious. Your consciousness is active and your physical mind is not uh, in control of it. You're in control of it. And when you come back to yourself, it is, uh, you remember, remember when you kid, some of your strongest memories, if you slam a door on your hand or somebody screams, you remember that incident? It's very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, it's like triumphant or uh, exciting, and it plants that memory right into you. That's what NDEs do. And then it leaves you with a sense of, man, I did that, okay? And now I know I can go for it. And you have opened a circuit to your consciousness and the other side when you NDE, and it all starts to chime in on you all the time you start to see things hear things it's 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 like somebody turned the volume up for you and now you're seeing and hearing it that's what that experience can do for you yeah i would totally agree it's like opening a door that was kind of locked a near-death experience is usually trauma traumatic and sort of knocks that door down right. and after that a person will most likely have regular obes right. absolutely opens it up yeah. Find it interesting that a lot of contactees yeah. had an NDE in their childhood. Certainly not all of them, but there's a weird connection there. Yeah. In fact, Kenneth Ring wrote a whole book about that, some of the connections. Yeah. It's a natural state of being for us to be in, just so you know. We're, we're taught not to think about it until we, you know, and then one day we wake up and we go, hey, <laughs> this is better for, this is more real to me than the real I'm living in. And why can't I have both at the same time? And you can. It's it's natural for you to be here and be able to do that. You you progress more. You evolve faster when you're in touch with everything. So yeah. Yeah. Speaking of out of body, I'm sure that you guys have told this before, but um, you guys had a really incredibly fascinating story of um, actually traveling. I believe Preston, uh, you gave Dolly quite the scare one time. Have you guys have you talked about that at length on this already or? You talk about it. <laughs> my my listeners yeah. would love to hear it if you don't mind uh, discussing it. You go first. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just let me give a shout out to Janice Conant for the wonderful donation through Super Chat. Thanks, guys. These are very, very helpful. So, yeah, OBEs. Okay, Jake, you asked for it. <laughs> I love this. I love OBEs. I mean, I, I adore them. Changed my life. But when I go out of body, it's always been very personal and somewhat subjective because while I do visit people, they've never been able to see me. It's disconcerting because you're like a ghost. I may have walked right up to them and they'll walk right through you. And you're like, this is crazy. And when it first started happening, it really made me question whether this was all even real or whether I was dreaming. Of course, I got proof at some point by going places and then out of body and then physically. But I met Dolly and I thought, well, you know, she's got mediumistic abilities. She's seen ghosts and on a whim, I just put it on my bucket list or just sort of remembered that I'm like, let's go visit her. Cause if you go through a whole process when you go out of body, you kind of just, you relax and you vibrate and suddenly you find yourself out. You know, now that I have a lot of practice, this happens quite often. I'm like, what do I want to do? 
And I said, let's go visit Dolly. Mind you, I'm in California. She's in Florida. And so I'm like, I'm going to see Dolly. And then whoosh. And this time I kind of teleported. Sometimes you're kind of floating along lazily. But I teleported into this garage kind of setting. There was a man sitting there in a lawn chair. And I looked at him in surprise. I'm like, who are you? And gosh, I forget his name. I think it was Norm. Norman. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, he says, my name's Norm. I'm like, oh, he's sitting there on a lawn chair, kind of looking gruff. I'm like, okay, hi, Norm. I'm looking for Dolly. Where's Dolly? He points to the doorway. <laughs> Didn't say a word. And uh, at that point, Dolly walks in, and she's on the phone. She's, got, she's talking on the phone. She's completely distracted. She's not looking at me. And I'm just kind of looking at her. I'm like, well, I made it. There she is. And then suddenly... She whirls around, looks at me, her, her hair flies. I'm like, whoa, she looks like she sees me. And then she locks gazes with me. I'm like, gosh, she does see me, I think. And, she's, and she looks straight in the eye and says, I can't talk now. I'm being robbed. I'm like, being robbed? No wonder she's on the phone. You know, she's probably talking to the police. And it was a strong emotion, pulled me right back. And... We were talking pretty much every day at that point because I'm doing interviews for Symmetry. And she didn't say anything when she called. I'm like, well, I'm obviously crazy. This didn't happen. She would have told me she's being robbed right off the bat. Uh, and then she says, oh, hey, I saw you last night. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you came to me out of body. I saw you. I was awake. And I'm like, really? What did you say? And she says, well, I was on the phone talking to this guy. And I said, I can't talk now. I'm with Rob. I thought, oh, okay, with Rob. So I, it was close, close enough where it was confirmation. Yeah. Now, mind you, it's midnight his time and 3, three o'clock in the morning my time. And this guy, Rob, Robert, would call me in the middle of the night and ask me to do a reading because he thinks somebody's trying to tell him something. And I was literally talking to him because his grandmother showed up as he called me and had a message for him and his sister. And I'm trying to get it straight. Who who did what to who? And then Preston shows up. And it's shocking to see him <laughs> because OBE, he does not look like he does now. He looks young. He has hair. He's fur. And I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> and I freaked out. I said, I can't talk to you. I'm talking to Rob. And that's when he went. So then I paid him back. I waited a couple of days and I waited until it was like two o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the morning, his time. And I showed up in his bedroom and said, Hey, and he saw me. I did. She woke well, I was sleeping. And you know, like, like you said, Jake, I like it dark <laughs> and a little bit of light will wake me up. And yeah. sure enough, my room was filling with light and I'm like, well, what's going on? But it was pretty golden, almost divine light. Wow. There, she's kind of leaning down over my bed, smiling, with slightly mischievous grin. <laughs> I'm like, oh, holy cow, Dolly. And yeah, you looked amazing too, Dolly. This gold and golden aura all around filled my room. Yeah. So yeah, and after that, she took me on some out-of-body adventures. She's really good at it. I'm wow. fairly good, but <laughs> mm -hmm. Dolly has one up on me on this. Uh, just my okay. opinion. Dolly could I, argue about that. I absolutely love that story. It's always fascinated with me or fascinated me. I, I did want to hop back if we, I think we have a little bit of time before the commercial or, or the broadcast oh. announcement. But um, so I, I failed to mention that um, after Indy, uh, that woman who I, again, I just didn't understand why I was supposed to communicate or I got the confirmation. The next person I reached out to, and again, this is very um, out of character for me because I just, I cut everything off, everybody off. I, I didn't, I wasn't in communication with anybody and here and there my friend i mean i had a very strong con connection to him he essentially what happened was he went on another podcast excellent podcast and um it's the first time i ever heard him and when i heard his song you know it's schizo uh schiz the plk um i heard his song uh it was featured on the podcast it was just a brief thing but i felt in like just, i don't know it was almost like a beacon i just wanted to learn more about it it's all about peace love and light so i went to schizomusic.com or i think i even found him on cloud and uh there's a song calling all hybrids and i don't know why but 
it just always resonated with me for no reason. I mean, I never had any, this is even before the baby presentation dream I had. And I, I'm not sure why, but the two people who I felt like I was supposed to be in communication with during that short amount of time was two people who can seriously considered that they were the hybrids and have also had baby presentation moments. And this is well before I had mine. And I believe my sister had hers, but she didn't tell me. I mean, it's in, I didn't tell anybody either. And then well, anyway, let me go back to, to Rafael Lugo, though, but which, by the way, he has a documentary coming out, I think, in like this the end of this month, which is called Calling All Hybrids. But um, is I just thought I found it to be odd that the two people that I felt like I was supposed to be communicating with were, were the two of them. So. So, yeah, I my sister had this. She didn't really talk about it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that it sounds so bizarre that you don't really tell people. And I brought it up to her. I was like, I was like, dude, I had this dream. I don't remember who handed it to me. And I can barely even remember what the child looked like. But I remember I didn't have a shirt on, which is odd. I'm a chubby guy. I don't, chubby guys don't like having, you know, they, they don't like to be uh, shirtless. <laughs> they just don't. So, but I, I, that was the first odd thing. And I felt like I was sitting down and you, I couldn't tell you what the face looked like of the person who handed it to me or the, the child itself. But I felt like I was supposed to hold it against my chest. Um, and then I told my sister that, and she's like, I've had that too. And, you know, I was like, really? And, uh, so all four of us have had that. Uh, I just, I think it's really odd. Um, so yeah, since then, I mean, he's like a big brother to me. I mean, we talk nearly every day, so he's a really good guy. Yeah. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. I, um, I loved your interview with him. I thought it was really good. Yeah, the yes. baby presentation is a pretty interesting thing here. I want to put pull up a, a picture I have of a lady I interviewed who had the whole baby presentation. And she was told basically that these children need to be loved and nurtured. And they asked her to hold the babies. And she was a little bit freaked out because some of them did not look quite normal. <laughs> uh, and uh, absolutely, her daughter was having full on encounters, fully conscious with grays and being pulled on board. Uh, and the mother was pulled on. She says, this wasn't a dream. I'll call it a dream, but it's not a dream. Uh, but she was met this human looking woman, which pictured here. And she said, this device looked like almost a Christmas tree with all these little incubators. And I've heard many different descriptions of this, but I asked her to hold a baby and totally freaked her out. Yeah, this is what we would call a baby presentation. So yeah. with your dream, was that at all similar to that? No, I mean, it was a singular child. And again, I, if you asked me to describe the face of the, the, the being that handed to me, I couldn't tell you. I know that it was taller than me and I was sitting down or, or even, I just remember that it was an incredibly small child, a thin child. Um, and it, the, the memory didn't last long. I just remember that it, I don't even know if they said it. I mean, maybe I just knew that I was supposed to hold it against my chest, my bare chest. Um, and then again, Raphael, Indy and my sister all had that same dream. So maybe that's why I felt, um, or somebody felt that I was supposed to be in communication with them, or at least that's how I perceive it. Wow. Mm. Well, that's significant. That's really cool. Yeah, dreams are important. And a lot of people who are having contact, it starts out coming back through their dreams. That was certainly true with Betty Hill, Betty and Barney Hill, really. Um, she remembered her experience almost entirely through dreams well before hypnosis. I think her dream recall was more complete and accurate, I, in my opinion, was certainly more complete than her hyp hypnotic recall. So yeah, pay attention to those dreams, folks. Whenever I interview someone who I think might be having contact, that is one of the things we go over is all of their UFO dreams. And I'm right in that boat because I'm my UFO dreams are off the charts <laughs> of being on board and seeing, I, I had a, you know, I saw a little baby on board a craft and there was all these people there and dressed in white kind of jumpsuits, I guess you would call it full body suits. There was a tiny itty bitty little baby kind of laying down, not quite on the floor, but almost. And I wanted to pick it up and they're like, no, 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 you can't. But it, she was smaller than my hand. I mean, a tiny little thing and didn't quite look fully human. But 
It was a, it was different, different from a normal dream. Would you say that that was true with your experience? It was different than a normal dream in any way? Yeah. I mean, it felt the same as, um, you know, so dream, not dream. I mean, I was so young for the, for the things in the room, or maybe I just, I don't know, maybe I was in denial, but, um, but the thing that I, I don't know how else to describe it, but the dull light that was coming into the room and just being completely struck and in fear. Um, that's, I mean, it felt the same way. I mean, I just, again, it just, it was nonsensical to me because I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't t tell you what the face looked like at all. You remember um, what the touch felt like, what it felt like to have the baby laying on your chest? Yeah. Smell the baby? No. No. Mm -mm. Did you feel the baby moving and wiggling in your hands? No, to be honest, no. no. No, I just, I just remember gently, and I don't have children, so I, you know, if you ask me to hold okay. a kid, I'm just, you know what I mean? But I just knew that I was supposed to hold it against my chest. Now I can't speak mm -hmm. for my sisters. Hers was slight. I would imagine she might have more detail, but um, I, that's just what I remember. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I have I have four hybrid children, and uh, the first two are males. My first one, I was seventeen, and I agreed at seventeen to have one. And the father of the child raised the child, and uh, Mama helped be a grandma to the child. I was learning to fly at the time and I didn't have, I didn't get to have that experience. I was too busy learning to fly. And so mama took in for me, but I knew who he was. Um, he's the same, uh, my first, I call him, <laughs> I call him Alexander. And uh, he came to see me when I was much older and to help me when I broke my elbow. And um, it was a shock when I saw him. I mean, I, it took me a minute to register who I was looking at, you know, and when I did, I was like, oh, my God, I know who you are, Alexander. And he's like, yes. And uh, he keeps up with me more than I keep up with him. And then I have another one named Huel. And then I have a daughter named Sophia. And I have another child. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the name of that child. It's a secret. And um, it's <laughs> the girl. So. so, all right. Well, we do need to take a quick station break. So just hold on a second. I want to thank you all. You're watching The Light Gate. This is episode 24, actually. I'm your host, Preston Dennett, author and researcher. My lovely co-host is Dolly Safran. She's the subject of the book Symmetry, which is all about her experiences. Our guest tonight is Jake Robbins, lifelong experiencer, podcaster of the podcast Aliens, UFOs, and Ghost Stories. And we are streaming live at 107.7 FM on the United Public Radio Network in New Orleans and the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3. And we're on Roku now, so check that out on Facebook and, of course, on YouTube. And keep those questions coming, guys. I'm putting little stars next to them, and we will absolutely get to them. Uh, because we always love it when we can share and bring everyone in chat into part of the show. It's part of what I hope makes our show a little bit different from others, is that we're one big family and tr exploring this topic to the best of our abilities and just having fun. All right. I think that's our station break. Did, did I forget anything, Dolly? <laughs> no, no. I have a question for Jake. Did you ever hurt a body part and uh, suddenly it healed itself and you couldn't figure out why? Uh, you know, I can't say for certain. I mean, I've recently had a rib injury that I didn't really feel went away anytime soon. I'm, you know, not to sound like a doofus, but um, I, I just feel, I do feel like I heal pretty quick. You know, I don't, you know, I, I've been in com like football, wrestling. Um, I have injured myself, but I do feel like I possibly get over it a little quicker. I mean, have I gotten really injured in the next day? It's completely gone. Not necessarily. Okay. What about in intuitive abilities and psychic experiences like you know, dreams that come true <laughs> or you know, stuff like that? If you had any of that. So I, I never feel comfortable calling myself psychic. I, I remember Dolly in our last conversation, you said while on craft that I, I was incredibly psychic and telepathic. I just um, never have said that really. Even Deb Schottke, um, a few other women uh, have, have said that they thought that I was. Um, if anything, if I, were, if I were to describe 
two things that I would pick. Number one would be empathic. Um, and the second, I suppose, would be clear audience, if I'm pronouncing that right. That's right. So for the that clear audience. You realize that, right? Those are all psychic abilities. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't want to. <laughs> you can't yeah. refute it. It's yeah. psychic ability. You have psychic ability. Okay. Right. Yeah. But yeah, like with the, the clear audience, I can get through, through this one relatively quickly. A lot of the times it's like, I'm certainly not sleeping. I know that, but it's like in a very rested state and I can, uh, sometimes it's just, it, it sounds like in distant talking and I'm like, is my TV on? And I know I it's heard not. That. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that exact thing. And a lot of times it's just in distant conversations where I can just barely understand what they're saying. But the most fascinating one that I've had was, um, this was about two years. Well, my sister would know she knows the exact date. I should know it, but I don't, but, um, about a year, year and a half ago, my yeah, yeah, my grandma had passed away. She was like the matriarch of our family. This is the same grandma who um, would have the ex-husband sit on the bed. And um, are you getting the, the repeat at all? It's, if it's on my end, it's fine. No, no. Okay. Good. So, just... okay, no worries. I, I, I'm used to it. But um, so. Yeah. So she had passed and, you know, being the only boy of four girls, you know, you kind of as dumb as it sounds, you kind of want to be the strong, like, you know, we're going to be fine. Everything's okay. So I didn't really grieve her death uh, whatsoever, to be honest. And then I was at work one day and um, I'm not somebody who gets, oh, back then I was, I get emotional quite a bit now, especially after what happened on Saturday. We'll get into that. But um, it was maybe 10 to, to two weeks, or, uh, 10 days to two weeks later, I was at work and I just had a complete breakdown. I mean, ugly crying, like a bad, you know, I crawl, called my mom as the moment she said, hello, I was just weeping. And, um, um, cause I never really grieved her and, you know, it was a long, hard day. I was very emotionally tired and I laid down, I was not asleep. And it was, uh, it was probably the time of year where I might have my wife or myself might crack the window and, out of nowhere, I hear a small group of people walking towards me and it didn't sound, it sounded like they were like on the same, I'm on the second floor. It sounded like, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Yes. And, and they were talking at first indistantly and I, I wanted to turn around and look, but again, I, I do not suffer from sleep paralysis. I was not sleeping fully and I couldn't move, but it got, the voices kept getting closer and closer until at one point i heard a man's voice if i had to guess it was at least four people and i for sure heard a man and a wife the man says that's tony's boy and then the woman just kind of going mm. so in the south where all my family's from in appalachia they wouldn't they might not say that's tony's son they they, they would say that's tony's boy so i always felt like and i don't i can't say for sure but i always wondered if that was you know my grandma you know in the afterlife and maybe whoever it may be kind of showing around like everybody's okay you know i yeah. i don't know i hear i hear mm -hmm. um, my family members when they come to talk to me or other uh, beings who have crossed over want my attention they speak to me i hear them audibly mm -hmm. and uh they'll start talking to me like um i and i'm supposed to know who they are and it takes me a second to like nail it who you know huh who are you speaking to? And then I realized they're talking to me. And um, some want my attention. Some just have a message they want to impart. And I'm like, I, I can't promise you. I'll try. Uh, the weirdest one I ever had was uh, my daughter was a teenager and a friend of hers died in a car accident. And it, unfortunately, I was right behind it when it happened. And um, that night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I didn't see him at first. I heard him. He was saying, Miss Dolly, Miss Dolly, Miss Dolly. And I was like, who am I talking to? And he said, it's me. And uh, he said his name and I know who he was. And I said, what can I do for you? And he said, my mother needs to hear this. And I have this little, little plaque with praying hands on it next to my bed. It's I was given to me. It's from Japan. And, uh, I've had it my whole life. And he kept, I saw him at that point. He was silhouetted and he's pointing to it. And he said, tell my mother, I know she's praying. I hear her. And I said, okay. And he said, tell her I love her and it's okay. It was my time. Don't know why it just was. And I said, okay. Now, 
what do I do with that? I get up the next day and get my daughter off to school. I can't talk to her about it. And they're getting ready for this kid's funeral. It was like a week and a half later. And we went to the funeral because my daughter wanted to go. And when we got there, the line, because he was a teenager in a county where everybody knew everybody in Georgia, 500 people were there. And we stood in line for over an hour to get up to, the, to where his parents were with him in the casket. And when I got up there, his mom acknowledged me. I knew who she was. And I told her, you know, I, I'm so sorry and everything. And Emmy was trying to talk to them and talk to his brother who was standing there. And I just looked at her and I said, I have a message for you. And I don't think now it's appropriate. Can I tell you sometime? And she said, no, I'll step back. Please tell me now. And uh, I said, I'm clairvoyant. I'm a medium. And I said, your son came to me last night. And I said, you don't know this, but I was behind him in the accident. I saw it happen. And she went, oh, my God. And uh, she first thing she wanted to know was how did it happen? What did I see? And I told her. And, uh, and then uh, I said, I have a plaque with praying hands on it from Japan. And she immediately had to sit down. And I was shocked. Why? Just telling her this. And she said, I have that plaque too at home. And I've been praying with it in my hands for him to come to me and tell me he's okay. Wow. And I said, well, I heard him. He came to me and he's okay. And I said, he loves you. And he said, it was his time. He doesn't know why it was his time, but it was his time. And he will never leave you, you know? And mm -hmm. she just burst into tears. People were staring at us. I got really embarrassed. And I didn't know what to do except hug her, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I felt relieved that I gave her the message, but it was very, very open in public and it freaked me completely out, okay? And a week later, she called me up and she said, will you meet me? And I said, sure. And she said, I have to see the plaque. And I said, sure. So I met her for lunch and I brought the plaque and she brought hers and they were identical. They were both from Japan. They both had the praying hands. And she just burst into tears and she said, this is real. This is real. I said, yes, ma'am, it's real. He's okay. He's, you listen, he'll, you'll hear him. And about a year later, she let me know. I saw her in a grocery store and she says, I can hear him now. I can hear him. It's like, wow. cool. You That's know? beautiful. Yeah. This is so important that people allow this to happen because we, we can block it so easily. But yeah, pay attention to your impulses, your intuitions because they are often trying to send you a message. And most people who lose a loved one will get it, some type of sign. I think it's like 80%, particularly if it's a spouse or someone very close to you. Uh, so it should be much more widely accepted and talked about, I think, mm. in our society. Yeah, I think that's really fascinating. The only other, you know, I said that, if anything, I, I'm empathic. I mean, I've always felt like I could pick up on people's energies and, you know, growing up right outside of Detroit, that's not something you go out of your way to tell your friends, you know? Um, but I always did. I mean, I always thought it was like, because I was from an inner city, like it was kind of like a spidey sense, like, Whoa, you know, this is, there's danger over there, you know, but like, I can't tell you how often I've just, you know, met a guy and like this, this is a dangerous guy. This is not a good dude. Uh, even now that I'm out of the city and not to sound, braggadocious but i'm right like every single time and i just don't understand how other people can't pick up on it you know or like when i meet um a woman like you dolly or uh, it's, a lot of times it's with women uh deb shotke um kimberly marie um who led the ce5 that i just attended uh she used to work along alongside uh richard i would say richard dr stephen greer and um so yeah that that's another thing I'd like to really quick too. So with Talada, um, have you ever felt like Talada kind of gave off like almost like a, a buzz or, or have you ever heard people say that they can almost feel like the vibration, the people that uh, you guys are picking up or no? Um, Talada, yes. I'm in contact with him a lot and uh, um, yeah, I can feel his, it's not really a vibration to me as much as it's, um, ooh, how do I explain this? the sound of him goes through me. I feel him. Okay. And it does vibrate. Okay. But it's, I'm perceiving his consciousness in me. You know, he pops in 
and he's not, it's not like I'm being indwelt by him or anything, but I feel him transmitting right through me. It's like, if you've been too close to a radio and it's too loud, you go, Ooh, okay. That's how I feel when it hits me and I have to stop what I'm doing and pay attention to him. Yes. Hmm. And I've asked him in the past, do you, how do you perceive me coming at you? Cause I'll call him first, you know, I'll make the message go to him first. And he says, I can, I can almost know when you're going to do it. He's interdimensional, so I think he already knows that I'm going to. <laughs> he's like ready for it when it happens. So, but yeah, it's it's a, it's personal. It's real personal. You're yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people describe that actually, feeling a vibration or a, an energy. In fact, there was a case that really was poignant when I was doing research for on schoolyard UFO encounters. You know, I wrote a book on just that cases like the Ariel Elementary School, but there was one case in North Carolina, actually, involving the North Carolina School for the Deaf, which is, of course, children who are profoundly deaf, um, since birth, some of them. And they had this UFO <laughs> come right down over the school so close that they thought it would actually hit the building. But all the deaf children came running out because they could hear it, quote, hear it, not with their ears, but it was the vibration, the buzzing of the craft itself that drew them all outside and they got to have this really wonderful close-up encounter with this ufo which was saying hi that's what they're doing with these schoolyard encounters so i love that question from uh, natasha there because that is so absolutely true yeah. they will absolutely uh send that feeling out yeah so. There's a sound that an earthquake makes when it's starting. And if you're in the pressure wave of it, you can feel it and you can hear it in your body. It's a low sub sound. Okay. And it vibrates. And that's generally what a uh, craft feels like and sounds like to those of us who are near them all the time. We fear that we feel that low vibration from it and it's energy coming dead at you. And it's a pressure wave because it's electromagnetic and it has a, a dense field around it and there's a there's an energy wave that pulses off it it's an emp you literally can feel it like an emp from a from a from an earthquake happening because they do emp and that's what you're feeling hmm. okay well thank you for giving me some clarity on that uh, my friend and i were wondering uh if, if that's the case so um so i was kind of trying to break up the owl stuff um I'd really like to get your opinion on the CE5. Uh, is that all right if I ask you about this? Yeah. Have we got enough time? There's a picture you sent me of this beautiful <laughs> owl. <laughs> well, well, that actually lines up really good. So I have to be careful when I say this, but I'll say it. I think you guys could probably get where I'm getting at. So, um, so that day was September 28th, 2023. Not very long ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, on September 27th, I work at a place where people call us about animals and, you know, whether or not we can get rid of animals or relocate them. So I've been working there for, well, the first time it happened, I was working there for less than two weeks. I get a call like, hey, do you pick up owls? And I was like, that's a great question. I don't know that one. Let me call my boss. And I was like, hey, boss, do we pick up owls? And he kind of laughed at me. He's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. He's like, uh, he's like, I've been in this industry for just under 20 years. I've never even heard of that. I was like, okay, so what do, I, what do you want me to do? He's like, call DNR. I don't know. So I was like, hey, miss, I'm really sorry. That's just not something we do. I didn't think much else about it. I really didn't, even though I'm like the owl person, you know, because I figured this has to come up sometimes. And he maybe he's just not answering the phones enough to know. And then September 27th, which I thought was a Thursday. I'm almost certain it was a Thursday. I get a phone call. Same thing. This time it's Allen Park, Michigan, right outside of Detroit. And this woman says, Hey, I got this owl in my backyard. Can you guys do something? I'm like, I can ask, uh, you know, I know what he's going to say. And I was like, Hey, you're not going to believe this, but this is another call about owl. He's like, seriously. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, call, tell him to call DNR. So I, I get right. As soon as I got off the phone with the boss, I called my other person who works there. I was like, how, how often have you got calls about owls? And he's been there for, I think like six years. He's like, never. I'm like, well, I just got two in two months. So what, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, cause I'm very new to the company. So I thought about it the next day. I guess I was on my mind. I create a T-shirt for, uh, the, you know, the podcast that has an <laughs> owl on it. And that was the 28th. And then while I'm at work, 
uh, a Facebook memory pops up. It says September 28th, 2012. Here's a photo. And it was me at a rent fest holding an owl for the first time in my life at the Renaissance Festival. Wow. And then, and then I guess it was just on my mind. I called my, my boss back. I was like, Hey, is it okay if I just go pick up this owl? So that, yeah, that was me at the rent fest. If you, it's really hard to see there's a little baby owl, but that of course was the first time I ever held one. That was exactly 11 years to the day that I went in and picked up uh, this owl. And so I called him, I went and picked it up. I met uh, this beautiful soul, Kimberly Marie. I mean, it was so close at, uh, like I left and I had to drive straight to this restaurant. Uh, the bird was fine. It was nice and cozy with a blanket inside of a small kennel. We ate quickly because I had to get the, and she's the one who led the CE5. She used to work alongside Dr. Stephen Greer. So I rehabbed it. I was giving it frozen mice. So from Friday, it, it barely ate. In fact, Friday night, I don't think it ate at all. It just drank water. Saturday mm -hmm. morning, it ate uh, two pinky mice, like frozen mice that I thawed out. And then um, Saturday morning. So, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Saturday, we went to the CE5. First ever CE5. And I'll circle back to that. And then Sunday, that's no, Sunday the 30th. Um, it finally, cause I'd leave the, the, uh, the door open every night, hoping it would kind of explore the yard and eventually fly away. <laughs> so I do this on Sunday. It walks out cause I'm clean, cleaning its linens and all the stuff in the kennel. And he tries flying up to, um, it tried flying up to uh, the trailer <laughs> of, of a pontoon and it couldn't <laughs> do it. And as soon as I did that, I was like, Oh, you're not ready, buddy. And I didn't rush it, you know, but I wanted to see what it would do. And then it flew up to the top of the fence, which is a little bit higher. And at this point, I'm like, what do I do? Like, do I try to make it stay? Cause it's not quite ready to fly. Then it flew onto a neighboring roof. I'm like, okay, here we go. And then, you know, part of me, like my heart's dying or my heart's breaking because I love this thing. I named it a And, um, and it was, you know, it was awesome because it did end up flying away. I knew it was the last time I'd see it. And, uh, it was really beautiful. And then my mom sent me, a uh, message late or earlier that day, well before he flew away, I just didn't see it. It was Facebook Messenger, and it was September thirtieth, two thousand sixteen, and it was exactly so. The day that it flew away, I sent her a video. She's like, "This is getting weird," and it was a video that I sent to her about an owl, and <laughs> I just I think the synchronicities are nearly impossible. Um, so I guess I was trying to break it up here. I I know we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm sorry for holding the floor this long, but. Um, no. so the very first C5, uh, I ever attended was a week ago. Yeah, it was Saturday. Uh, what would that be? Saturday, the 29th. And I was invited by this woman, um, Kimberly Marie, and we got connected through Deb Schottke. You guys know Debs? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I don't I haven't met her, but we know who she is. Yeah. She's really, really, really cool. And, um, so we went to a C5 and I invited, uh, my sister and, you know, it was really cool. I mean, to be perfectly honest, did I think we'd see anything at all? Not really. You know, I just, I figured you'd, get, you'd have to go to like 10 of these to see one. I didn't think that the probability was very high. Um, there was about just under 30 of us. We went to this incredibly beautiful, I mean, it was wide open, not the light pollution was like non-existent. It was absolutely beautiful. And um, before we could even set our chairs up in a circle, I was the first one. I was like, hey, this is the first star. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, cool. And I was like, oh, there goes the first satellite. And then it goes and changes direction. And then it goes down. I'm like, okay. So that was the first ever, you know, thing I ever saw. So before we even meditated, things were going crazy. And that was crazy enough for me. Had, had that only happened, that would have been enough. And then. Um, yeah, well, it's definitely not a satellite. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's, no. There's no way. Yeah. So, you know, and then we went into this. Kimberly Marie, she put on this absolutely incredible, very intense um meditation i mean we were doing shamanic chants she, we were, she was doing like a sound bath with like a drum a tiny like native american drum on either side of your you know behind your head um very 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 intense uh uh meditation and then you know i didn't know we were going to do this but we were all kind of quiet for a while and in my head i don't know why i don't know if it was the shamanic chants or the um the drumming but it reminded me of my ancestry you know i didn't really go into it with that intention per se but you know, it was so quiet for so long. Um, I got emotional. I was crying. My eyes closed the whole time. 
And in my head, I was saying, hey, if any of our any of my ancestors can hear me, my Native American ancestors, if you could join us in this meditation, um, you know, let, let us hear your music, uh, your chanting. And at one point, we I heard multiple people heard drumming in the background. Um, it sounded like it was quite a bit as a bit away or it was quite a ways away and multiple people heard it. And uh, I never saw anything. And be, be, besides that uh, drumming, which only lasted a moment, um, you know, we ended the thing and then we said, you know, we kind of go around like, does anybody have anything to share? And I was like, anybody hear that drumming? <laughs> and, you know, like <laughs> at least one third of us said, yeah, we heard it. And then the next guy to share was directly across this huge circle from uh, my sister and I. He's like, I have something to share. He goes, he goes, uh, you know, when I opened up my eyes um, while we were still in this medit or, you know, meditation, we were all being silent. He said all around the circle were about 30 to 40 Native American people. So like we didn't go around and just say, hey, my name's Jake and my intentions to do this, you know, and for him to say that, I mean, you know, I felt like somebody hit me in the chest with a sledgehammer, like what? And uh, I told I shared with him that that was my intention. And then he also said that um, off to the distance directly behind my sister and I, like, who knows, 100, 120 yards, there was a cylindrical craft. And he said uh, two beings walked out, a male and a female. And he, I'm like, did they approach the circle? He's like, nope. I'm like, did they telepathically communicate with you? He's like, no. He's like, they just stood there. And I was like, well, what do you think they were? And before he didn't even think about it. He's like, Palladians. Um, did I see that? No. But Kimberly Marie also saw the craft and she also saw the Native Americans. I don't think she saw the beings. But um, in and, and their mind's eye. I mean, I, I don't know that they were physically there, of course. But um, so that's the first part. I guess, what do, what do you guys think about that? Or how would you interpret that? Um, it was more or less probably um, being telepathically sent to you. ETs are not physically coming here right now. They cannot. And any contact that we're having now is psychic. Um, they have some drones that are watching what's happening to our solar system right now. And they're monitoring that and the Earth and what goes on around here. But they're not really flying here at all. And uh, but they can contact you. And if you meditate and you ask them to come in, they can let you see them. So that that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The fact that you asked your ancestors to show up, that's even more incredible to me, actually. That's that's like that's like mm -hmm. I know you're there. <laughs> show <laughs> yourselves, you know, and they did. That's very, very, very cool. They're all probably partying around you guys. I'm not kidding you. That can happen. Yeah. So. That was very, very cool. spiritual. They had a huge spiritual. ETs are as spiritual as we are. Mm -hmm. They OBE as well. They can transfer their mind over great distances and remote view you, or they can what what you call is be in two places at one time. Okay. By locate, yeah. By locate, mm -hmm. and so you're seeing them. You can see them. They're sending you that, but they're not physically here right now at all. So that was a big deal. I mean, you have to understand that that's a big deal for them to do that for you. That's a big deal. Very big deal. Yeah, wow. that, that, that was, I mean, what it was for me is like, I was, I was always sitting at like a 98.5. Like, is this really happening? Is this in my head? Are the owls like, is it just all, you know, by chance? But when that happened, it was, it was, it was over. Not, and so that's the first of the two things that happened. So uh, you know, this is my C5. I'm assuming that this is typically how it goes, but you know, it's really intense. I was really emotional. Quite a few people were, uh, one woman was very emotional and, um, we took a break, you know, we kind of used the bathroom. I think we had some snacks like oranges and stuff like that. And we met back up about a half hour later. Mm -hmm. And this time I went over to my sister. I was like, Hey, I'm going to specifically, my intention is going to either be for us to hear as a group an owl or for, for one to to, to fly over us. And she's like, okay. And I just wanted somebody to know that that was what I was going to ask for. Cause I strongly believe that it would. And we went into this beautiful, again, like they were absolutely incredible how they put this thing on. And, uh, that's, I mean, we didn't, I mean, we were doing the ohm, like the overlapping ohms, like, um, different chants, like, um, and it was really powerful. And then we, again, we went into that silence and I'm not making this up. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I mean, maybe it was because I had an owl at my house that I left to go do this thing, but oh. I kept, 
that was already my intention. I kept when I my eyes were closed, I kept seeing the eyes of an owl, like yellow and then black, you know, like staring directly into mine in my mind's eye. My eyes were closed and I became a, a incredibly emotion, emotional. I took my my uh, I opened my eyes because I was, had my head back like this, you know, but they were closed. They, mm -hmm. they were like face and I had my palms like this for some reason <laughs> facing yeah. the sky. I just I don't know why I did. But, you know, when you have your head back, your tears go into your ears. And it was like the strangest right. sensation. I did not like that. So I went and I wiped my cheeks and I wiped my ears. I look up and dude, I swear to God, a flow, an owl flew directly over me. It felt like it was like 12 to 15 feet above my head. And I go, oh, you know, because we're supposed to be being quiet. And like there, I think there was like eight to 10 people who already had their eyes open anyway. And I saw like a guy like, you know, because he just like was not. Expecting <laughs> it. But um, that to me, I mean, like what else? You know, I mean. You know that's double confirmation there it's insane yeah i mean i don't know how many people within the group were actually putting out intentions you know per se you know and maybe if they were it was just like i'd really like to see something in the sky like an orb but i specific i wanted answers i wanted like to know like is this real is this actually happening or not and uh what's really fascinating is um i've done a lot of studying on owls owls typically are going to avoid stuff like like groups you know we were chanting exactly they stay away from it yep yeah i mean because why would that i mean that we were burning sage we were doing ohms like you'd think that they would avoid us altogether so it's just for me it, that took it to a hundred percent and i don't know how else to say it i've been incredibly emotional since then you know <laughs> i think I've, sure. I've probably cried like cried like five or six times since saturday well, i mean i guess it's a little more than saturday now it's probably like what is that today's monday so I don't know. It's just, it was such a powerful experience. I just can't stop thinking about it and racking my brain. I mean, that's why I immediately called uh, Mike Cleland. I was like, Hey man, can you make sense of any of this? You know? So. All right. Well, I, I, wanna, to... I want to start bringing some questions at some point though, because we have a half an hour left. But right. yeah, go ahead. Oh, you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. This one is an interesting question, which is actually about owls. And I'm not sure how much we can, comment on this but this is from nautical strings who says hello preston dolly and jake i had a dream with or of an owl with the head of a sphinx and it was beautiful does that mean something or just a dream and since my name is first i'll comment first <laughs> um i don't think any dreams are just dreams i think we have a tendency to sort of put dreams down and i think that they are actually very important even if it's just a psychological message or a message from an actual spirit or a memory of an actual experience or something it's there's a message there yeah. having sure. studied dreams intensely i think their messages often from ets spirits or your higher self and when some a dream is repetitive or it has a really strong impact on you it's super important and it's very hard for someone else to interpret it uh, but the fact that it has a head of a sphinx, um, that's definitely unusual. All no, it's not. It's not unusual. There are hieroglyphs <laughs> of, Egypt of owls with the head of a sphinx. Look it up. Mm. That would be your homework to do. Okay? Yeah. Not nautical. Go look it up. <laughs> There's such a thing. Okay? Mm. There's a message in there for you. Go look. What do you think, Jake? Any comment? <laughs> I mean, at the very least, I, I sincerely feel like between the Adomi thing and uh, the psychic uh, woman, Diana Calamia, um, I have if we have time, I'll tell some more stories about her, her premonitions, uh, which are, it may have saved my wife's life. Sincerely, it's not over exaggeration. I believe it. I mean, that that doesn't sound I mean, look at look up Chris Bledsoe's uh, experiences and how, how right. they seem to be connected with Egypt. I mean, I believe yeah, there's nothing about that I wouldn't. Um, that I would not believe for sure. Yeah. All right. Here's a question from Janice Conant. And this is for you, Dolly, because you mentioned mm -hmm. that your um, area is the Midwest. So where are you talking but that you're scooping people up? Um, from Ohio all the way over to Illinois in uh, Minnesota and uh, down all the way to um, um, Missouri and Kentucky and back over in the other direction toward Kentucky. Very so. interesting. Yeah, I know when we did UFO Con in California. Indiana. Yeah, yeah. When, when we did UFO Con in California, 
know, that, that was your first conference. You came over to California and there was a lady there <laughs> who was looking at you and you were looking at her and turned out, yeah, you had scooped her up. I freaked out. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> She's like, I know you. <laughs> I watched it happen. It was funny. Yep. All right. That's the question from Janice Connett. All right. Let's see. Here is another question. And this is from Nautical Strings. And this is directed to you, Dolly. Why do some people remember the abduction without regression? Dolly won't use that word, by the way. Just yeah, it's content. <laughs> The government wants you to think of it as an abduction. It is not. It's contact. Um, you remember because you have no, um, um, you're innocent in your thinking, no fear. You're not afraid. Whatever you're looking at, you have a desire to investigate and remember, and you will. People are that way. I'm that way. I'm one of these weird people that <laughs> I don't see danger. I don't see fear. I go straight into it. And uh, yeah, it, it's creepy. Sometimes I've walked into situations that I probably shouldn't have because I'm curious as a cat. And a lot of people are that way. And they don't think to be afraid in those moments. Something is missing in their brain from that moment. And that's why they remember. So. All right. Well, moving along. And we were talking about baby presentations. And Tools is asking, why can't E.T. hold the baby? They do. They do, but often these are babies that people are directly connected to. Right. And the ETs want to give them an opportunity mm -hmm. to bond with them. Yeah, and I can explain it a little bit further. Um, we have very good senses of smell, mothers especially. Mothers can tell the smell of their baby over every baby in the room. They can pick them out just by their smell. ETs have unbelievable senses of smell, especially the grays. And a baby can smell like a dog can smell its own children or a father can smell that it's related to you. ETs have that ability and they want the baby to smell you because you're related and it comforts the baby. That's why. Very cool. All right. Let's move along to the next question then. And this is from Chris. You know, to again speaking towards the baby presentations he's asking jake do you think you might be a protector of the young um not not children in general or infants in general um i think that you know if i do have a hybrid child um i would assume that they wanted me to um be associate associated with it or hold it at least momentarily so he kind of get that bond with me that they, they most likely aren't getting from DET. Uh, it's it's ironic though that you say that, and then I know that's not exactly what you mean, but I sincerely have this uh, incredible sense that I'm supposed to be helping people my age or younger specifically to start to take this serious and, and believe that it's possible so more people can kind of be accepting of it. Um, so when the day comes, if it does come, uh, possibly for integration, that it's not going to be so scary or impossible to them. So I know, I know that's not exactly what you're asking but yeah <laughs> good job all right let's get through some because there's some more here's one of my favorite questions tonight and this is from schizo music tv i believe a friend of yours uh, and he is asking is it possible that most experiencers are waking up now because there is something coming because i feel more and more of us contactees are finding each other yes Absolutely. Positively, no doubt. Everybody's waking up. ET is uh, throwing information at us at an extremely high rate. And the more you practice it being psychic and become open to the knowledge of them, uh, they will send you as much information as they can. Our solar system is going through a tumult. And uh, we have an electromagnetic current sheet sleuthing through us right now. Our sun is changing polarity and so are all the planets. And uh, our sun is in solar maximum right now, and we have some serious stuff headed at us. That's why ET cannot be here because of it. But when they can, when the poles finish changing and our magnetosphere firms back up, they will come back because we have more after that. And they're going to be picking people up, just so you know. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I think some people, it's, it doesn't benefit them to remember immediately because it can interrupt your life. You've got a life mission. You've got things you want to accomplish. But I've talked to a lot of contactees who at some point do get what I would call a trigger or a cue. And this is when stuff starts coming back or it's time. They have, they've reached a point in their life where they feel like they're ready to start exploring it perhaps. And this is when they start having dreams. This is when it all starts to, you know, the weird coincidences and the synchronicities build up. So yeah, I think that's a great question and I totally agree. All right, let's see here. What else do we have? Oh, this is kind of an interesting one. This is more of a, a comment. This is from Adam Ward. I had a dream that a UFO pod was in front of my house. The guy inside wanted me to go for a test ride. When I sat inside the seat, it sucked me into it. After that, we flew from coast to coast, testing it. Adam, that sounds like a, a memory, perhaps, of flying a UFO, because they do that. That's exactly what they do. Yep. No, That's no. All coming. Yep. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's see. Here is another one. I wanted to hide this. Dun, dun, dun. And here is a good question. And this is from Janice Connett to Jake. Have you had any feelings of premonitions happening soon? You know, I, I've always, this is, this is going to sound strange, but I sincerely uh, mean this uh, right around my late teens, early twenties. I had a sense that I was going to be on planet earth when something changed uh, what it was. I, I don't know. Um, at one point in my life, I, I perceived that as I, I chose to come here um, to be like volunteered to come here to be one of the last beings who live. Um, <laughs> But do I think something catastrophic necessarily is going to happen? I can't say for sure. But I sincerely do feel like something is going to be different. There is going to be a radical change. What that is, if if I were to guess, I would be I'd be lying. I don't know. But I do I do feel uh, strongly that something is going to change. Uh, what, what that is, I can't really know for sure. Yeah, that's something a lot of contactees absolutely agree on. I hear that all the time. And Dolly talks a lot about that in the book, Symmetry. Yes, big change is coming. <laughs> All right, I'm going to bring up this comment, which is controversial, but I want everyone to feel safe to talk about everything. And this is something a lot of people do talk about. This is from Chris Phoenix, who says, this is not even a question, really, but I suspect that most ETs are nothing more than fallen angels and demons. Sorry for using the old term. You know, Chris, I'm just going to comment here that I studied demonology and it follows a very set pattern, a demonic haunting that is quite different. And if you look at traditional religious terms, two, two thirds of the angels are not fallen. So it'd be much more likely that they would be angelic rather than demonic. But in my own research, and I think this is supported by the first 10 cases, I don't think honestly that they're demonic i think some people have chosen a demonic path i think this is something our governments would love us to believe i think some of them might actually believe this themselves i don't know but i have to you know i'm bringing this up because this is something a lot of people do believe and i want to dive deeper into it one day and just kind of parse it all out but yeah i want everyone I would to have like to make an observation to yeah. demons are upon the earth and in the earth around the earth Okay, they fallen means they're here, not there. Um, when an ET is coming here, it's coming in a craft, a physical craft, and they have physical bodies and they breathe physical air and they eat and they drink and they sleep and they have children. Demons do not do this. Uh, you have to know the difference between the two things. If you see a demon, you should know what a demon it is. If you see an ET, you should know what an ET is. Demons are not capable of producing craft. Demons are not capable of producing uh, your moving into a craft and going for a ride. Demons are not capable of that. Nowhere in the history of the world has there ever been a story about a demon doing any such thing. So we have two types of reality going on at the same time. We have the spiritual world and then we have the physical world. 
ETs are in the physical world with us. They live in the third dimension with us. They live in this galaxy with us. This is different than a demon on the earth. And a demon on the earth is basically either a fallen angel, as you describe, or somebody who is locked here because they whatever they did on earth has them in a mindset where they can't leave yet and they're just walking around PO'd. So take it from there. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I just want to bring that up because, you know, we yeah. all deserve to have a, a platform for right. our thoughts. Chris is a great guy. He, he's on a, a he, he follows a lot of shows and I'm impressed with his thirst for knowledge and he questions everything. And I congratulate him on that. That's a good thing. So. All right. Here is another question, which I'm not sure I understand, but I'll give it a try. This is from Kendlin. I have a question. I had an experience when I was younger where my brother and I witnessed a vacuum card floating in midair. Since then, I've had recurring dreams about being able to, let's get the rest of this, levitate objects with my minds and eyes. What could this be? I'm not sure if the levitating, what a vacuum card is. Uh, so maybe you could clarify that. But Me. yeah, levitating objects with your minds and eyes. This is a natural human talent that we can do in the other side, the OBE state. So I think that's probably pointing towards an awakening of that talent. I'm just going off my intuition there, but maybe you guys have a comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I know somebody who I know and love, um, Rafael Lugo has expressed this multiple times. I, I don't have any memory whatsoever um, of this, but uh, I, I've interviewed multiple people who I do sincerely believe uh, have done this, especially while on craft. Wow, very cool. All right, so we're getting to our last 10 minutes here. I do still have some questions here. And this is from Allison Carr. Do you find the extraterrestrials loving beings? In my experience, every single UFO encounter I've had, dream-wise or direct UFO contact or even more, has been absolutely benevolent and amazing. It's my experience. And I would say most of the people I've interviewed yeah, it can be very scary, but some have described a love like they've never felt before. Direct quote. Uh, overwhelming love from them. So, yeah, absolutely. I don't know what you guys feel. Dolly, I know, would say yes. Yes, I'm going to read a poem. I read it a lot. It's uh, Talata wrote it, and it's in the beginning of symmetry. And this is how they feel about love. This is how literally their message to us about love. And it says, be strong in love. Love is what carries through. Love is what heals. Love is the strength of life. Love has no limit. Therefore, let love become who you are. Let love evolve to its fruition. Let the light that is love burn bright. Let its wisdom guide you to higher understanding. And let its power move you to teach its power to others. Love, be strong in love. Yes, they are loving beings. I, um, I actually just read that to Mike Clolin. He loved it. <laughs> and we spoke. We spoke on uh, a few days yeah. ago. Yeah, he, yeah. He, Oh, and that comment was not card. It's cord. That makes more sense, mm -hmm. Kevin. <laughs> yeah, that's probably your uh, <laughs> the silver cord that attaches you to right. the physical body. So, thanks yeah. for clarifying that. That even I think makes it more clear that it's connected to the astral realms. Very cool. All right. Let's move along here. This is just a comment. Your praying hands story was exquisite, Dolly. Thank you for sharing that one. That is so cool. And I think we should all pay attention to the intuition that we get because these sort of things do happen. Yes. All right. Here is a question from Kim King. Question. Will this event come to happen within the next 18 months or is it possible to determine this? So the big change is coming. Yeah, Dolly, you said it's within the next 18, 18 months to two years. Yes, 18 to 24 months. Um, our uh, magnetosphere is down. Uh, they're saying 35%. Talat is telling me it's at 38, almost 40% right now. If we have a CME, a coronal mass ejection off the sun during this time, and it's in the X class range to the fourth, fifth, sixth, or higher power, it will down the world's grids permanently 
no more. They will not exist anymore. They will be unrecoverable. It will be 10 miles deep straight into the ground. Nobody will have power. Nobody will communicate with anybody. We will all be stranded from one another, literally. Um, you need to prepare for that. Um, the last 50 years of our lives here in this country and around the world, they've known it. The governments have all known it. They're prepared, but they have kept us clueless. And I just imagine the reasons why. Prepare, prepare to be off grid. Think about what it would take for you to live without power. That means you need to have water, food, shelter of some sort. When that grit, when that CME hits us, it will burn metal. I'm not kidding you. The one that hit in 1859 took down every single wire that was up for telegraph and pounded the telegraph offices. Look at how much wire we have in this country now in your house everywhere. Think about what that's going to do. So, yeah, we need to prepare for you. You need to seriously consider, quit buying junk, and think about how you're going to survive this. Or if you want to, that's your choice. Okay. All right. Well, we've still got a few more questions that I think we have time for. So here is, well, this is just a comment, really. Won't the pole shift be a near extinction level event? What yeah. that means, what that means is that a near extinction level event is we're already under that. It's already happening to us. We have tons and tons of gamma radiation coming into us and it's taking down our DNA and it's confusing animals who rely on magnetism to uh, navigate and they, they're running into things blind. They're starving themselves to death. Their DNA is derazzing ours is as well. The reason that uh, ET has been coming and we've made all these contacts with y'all was to help keep your DNA up. Now they're not here. So we're all at extinction level event. More cancer, more mental disorders, more heart attacks, everything. You're going to see people and animals losing it until this finishes. I almost keep hoping that that CME would just go ahead and get it over with so we could get out of the situation we're in. Um, yeah, well, whatever happens, it's all good news as far as I'm concerned because yeah. we are immortal beings. Right, yeah. And you don't life have to on Earth is really negative. hard. That's right, because we're going to go on no matter what. This is a bypass for us. I mean, we're just here for a short period of time, and then we move on. So whichever way you want to deal with it, you deal with it. That's all. all right. Let's whip through the last four of these or so, five, okay. real fast, Dolly, because it looks like okay. a lot of these are towards you. That's oh. all right, Jake. Of course, yeah. <laughs> <You're>, yeah. <laughs> no, so you feel fine. free to pop in anytime on, if you have any thoughts on these. I'm curious, too, on Dolly's thoughts on Nibiru. Truth or a bad rumor? It's a, it a bad point? lie. It's misinformation. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. This is a comment from Chris about our boy Jake has a Saint Michael standing behind him. He's ready for the battle. All there right. you go. <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Let's see. This is from Chris. Team. Dolly, how long will it be before they, I'm assuming the ETs, can come back? As soon as our magnet magnetosphere. Once our poles change the uh, lines of electromagnetic field guidelines that go from the center of our planet that shoot out like this, become more stable and they stabilize, they can come back then. They're erratic now. They're very unstable and they can't fly here. That's why they've been crashing for the last 50 years because they've been fighting it. And it's just gotten to the point now where they can't fly here at all. So as soon as that changes, we're good. And that will all mean right. the goals will change. Okay. We have time for just a few more. Well, one or two more questions. Here's one from Natasha. And thank you for the super chat. Dolly, do you know if I have hybrid children? Because I, I guess I remember. If you remember, then you do. Ask yourself. I would never answer this for you. You have to answer it for yourself. We all have a responsibility to understand ourselves, heal what we know or don't know, and learn the best way we can. Knowledge is your Knowledge is everything. And personal knowledge that you can employ is the best way. If you have a memory, start doing the dream journal thing, start thinking about it, start asking the universe to give you the truth. It will, it will tell you. All right. One more question real quick, and then we're going to have to wrap the show up because we're okay. getting to that time, but this is a good question. Do you think this is from Dana one could go their whole life with never having any memory of visitation, even though they've been visited? 
Yes, I'm going to say yes. Absolutely. Plenty of people like that. Absolutely. I've We've pulled people on board and um, they know the drill, okay? When they're on board, they somehow, their super conscious is like, okay, I know where I am, okay, okay. But the minute we're getting ready to take them back, they just loop right back around. They're like, hmm, and they don't remember. They come back and their physical mind will not remember a thing. You can go your whole life like that. Yep. Very cool. All right. I uh, guess that's, let me see. I, I can't take that comment off for some Click reason. On. Here, I can um, do it. How's that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, Jake, thanks so much for coming on the show. I want to give you a chance to give any shout outs to, let me see if I can pull up your uh, podcast thing here real quick. And uh, yeah, if you have any last words you want to say, now would be the time. I really just want to thank you too. I mean, <clears throat> uh, believe it or not. So after that incredibly long, you know, nearly a year that I was gone, um, it's like the universe put me in connection with the two of you, you know, um, you guys were the first, I just called it season two. I didn't know what else to call it I was gone <laughs> for a very long time, but you, yeah. you two were the first, uh, people I reached out to and it meant the world to me and my sister. Wow. And, um, I, I wrote far too many questions down for you guys, but, uh, there are maybe a couple things that my sister and I perhaps via Facebook messenger would love to, uh, to Absolutely. Ask. No but, problem. Uh, but yeah. I just want to thank you guys more or less than anything other than shouting out, you know, if you guys are interested in listening. Um, it would mean the world to me. And I really, I just rather thank you guys. I really love you guys. And I think you guys are really beautifully yeah, kind you. people. So thank you. You are too. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. We, all, we all have to talk to one another. We all have to let yeah. each other know what's going on. So this is not a problem. Okay. It will happen. And okay. thank you guys for all the super chats. It makes a huge difference. I really, really, truly appreciate it. And it's just so generous and it warms my heart that you are sharing so much. So thank you so much. We'd like to thank you all for coming to the light gate today. And we hope to see you next week. I want you all to, everybody to have a wonderful week ahead until that day. All love, all kindness. Namaste. Love and you guys. See you.